So therefore, our daily life, our families, our children, our relationships, our workplace, our colleagues, our friends, people, our neighbors, people we like, people we have problems with, all of them, our health is on the path. Each one of them. Every breath we take is a practice. Nobody can say, I have no time to practice. So, the next which carries on from this is virya, which means effort. But effort in the sense of a kind of enthusiasm, really. Because anything which we really enjoy doing, we do effortlessly, and yet we make a lot of effort, if you see what I mean. And so therefore the, the spiritual path should not be a drudge. You know, you shouldn't be kind of, you know, with the heavy rucksack of, of rocks on your back. It should, the, the dharma, the spiritual practice should be like yeast in the heavy dough of life. Right? You don't throw the dough away. But you mix it with the yeast and everything lightens up. So, therefore, you know, if one is really trying to integrate the spiritual into our daily life, it should make us lighter, not heavier. It shouldn't be an extra burden we're carrying with us. This is very important. I always thought that humor, a sense of humor, should be the seventh parameter. You know? Really, you know, somebody said, you know, enlighten up. Brighten. So this, this, um, this parameter about effort just means that as with any skill, we have to apply ourselves. Recently it was shown that if you want to become accomplished in any skill, especially music or sport, it takes at least 10,000 hours of practice. So that's just to learn how to use your fingers. What to speak of how to develop the mind. It takes a lot of practice takes a lot of effort to become effortless. So all these people promising you enlightenment in 10 minutes or a weekend course, <laughs> sorry. But it's possible. And as with any skill, as I said, if you enjoy it, then it doesn't seem like work. You know, it, it, it's a pleasure to put in practice. I had a friend who, um, in Tasmania, they, they had a son who, when I first met him, was maybe about 10 years old. And he would spend about six hours every day, on top of all his schoolwork and other uh, activities, in practicing the guitar. And now he's an excellent uh, guitarist. He's won many prizes around the world. He plays classical Spanish guitar. And uh, he's a beautiful musician, beautiful. But I know from early on he was practicing, practicing, practicing. But nobody told him to. His parents could have cared less. He loved the guitar. So for him, those hours and hours of going over scales were a joy. Outside it looks like, my God, it goes over and over and over. But for him, 
It was the best time. And so therefore, when we talk about effort, it shouldn't sound like something, you know, um, heavy. It, it, we, and therefore, in that way, enthusiasm is a better word because it gives the idea of a joy in doing something. If you really enjoy doing something, you will do it and expend enormous, what outwardly looks like enormous amounts of time and effort, but inwardly it is such a pleasure. So, also on the spiritual path, unless we have that sense of, of joy in our practice, it's not going to take off. And so this sense of enthusiasm is very, very important. But along with the enthusiasm does come the effort. Because it's not enough that we go occasionally to, you know, a Dharma center or a temple or a church or wherever and, and get a big high from being there and then we come back down and it all drops away and we go back to being who we ordinarily think ourselves to be. We have to take that and integrate it into our life. We have to make our life our enthusiasm. Transforming, using all these different techniques that we hear about, finding a few which really speak to us, and merging them with our daily life. Again and again and again and again, and especially patience. Somebody does something to annoy us and we get upset. Okay? Well, the point is then not to get angry with ourselves for getting angry. Right? Okay, right, fell down, start again. And sometimes we, we're okay, sometimes we're not. It reminds me of, like, you see very, very small children. They're just learning how to walk. And so their legs are all bowed out, and they're, and they're very weak and wobbly. And, and they, they, they're holding on to something, and then they take a few steps, and they fall down. And they pull themselves up again, and they walk another few steps, and they fall down. And then they pull themselves up again and they keep walking. The point is that no little child says, uh oh, this is not working. <laughs> Clearly, my legs are too weak, <laughs> not the right shape. They can walk. Me, I, I can't walk. I'll never be able to walk. No, sorry. This lifetime they're walking, uh -huh. and they just sit. I mean, no child is that stupid. <laughs> Children say, they can walk, I can walk. I'm going to do it. I mean, they don't even think about it. They know that however weak they might be right now, if they keep going, they'll get it. And so this is what we have to be. We have, you know, an aspiration. And then we fall down. Okay, we're humans. This is the whole point. If we were so perfect, we wouldn't need a path. We need a path because we have problems. If it's not this thing, it's something else. So then we pull ourselves up. We walk a bit further, and then we fall down, and then we pull ourselves up. And gradually, like a little baby, we start getting strength. We start getting a sense of balance. We start beginning to say, oh, it is possible. Look, I didn't get so upset. Before, I would have gotten really upset when he said that. But this time, I didn't. Actually, I thought it was kind of humorous. I felt sorry for the guy. You know? And so instead of feeling upset and angry, we can feel a sense of equanimity and also of compassion and loving kindness. And if we do it even once, we recognize we can do it. 
just needs practice. Just takes practice. One time when I was in India, um, I had just finished retreat and um, uh, I had been asked to start a nunnery, but I had no idea how to start a nunnery. So I was thinking to go back into retreat. <laughs> and I went to South India, and we went to see this, um, my friend, he took me to see this astrologer. He wanted to meet him. So then I, I said to the astrologer, look, I have this problem. You know, should I go back into retreat, or should I start a nunnery? So then he did his calculations, and then he said, well, if you go into retreat, very peaceful, very pleasant, very happy, very nice. If you start a nunnery, many problems, many conflicts, many challenges. But both are good, so you decide. <laughs> so I thought, right, back in retreat. Um, but then I happened to speak to a Catholic priest and told him. And he said, well, of course you start the nunnery. He said, we are like pieces of rough wood. And if we are always stroking ourselves with silk and velvet, that's very nice. But we don't get smooth. To get smooth, we need sandpaper. So, therefore, all these problems, all these difficulties, all these people who create problems, they are sandpaper to make us smooth. So we're grateful. Thank you for being my sandpaper. Hmm? But all of this requires presence of mind and effort to really bring this into our life. These, these new ideas, we need to practice them again and again until they become spontaneous, until they become effortless for us. So the fifth paramita is meditation. I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. Is that all right with you? I'll be a little... Brief. Basically, of course, in Buddhism there are many, many forms of meditation, but they can be um, traditionally divided into two. One is that of um, shamatha, which means calm or peaceful, and one is of vipassana, which means uh, insight. So the it's like if you have a wild horse. That wild horse has great potential, but it's wild. And we want to train it. But we can't train it until we first tame it. So we have to tame the horse. We have to get the horse to quieten down, to be trusting, and to be amenable to being trained. And so this first level of, um, of practice is to make our minds soft and um, pliable and at the same time quiet it down and make it more centered so that where we put our attention, the mind naturally settles on that. Because normally our minds are very scattered. So this is the first level. It can go into very deep levels of uh, mental uh, absorption. We could compare it to um, uh, like a pond or a lake in which when all the winds are blowing, that means all the sensory um, our eyes and ears and nose, etc., all the stimuli coming in from that together with our own mental uh, thoughts and thinking and so on, all of that is churning up the mind continually, like winds on, on the surface of the lake. So, all you get are lots of waves. 
So then when you look at the lake, all you see are waves. And it also churns up the mud, and you can't see down into the lake because there's so many waves going on there. So the first thing is quieting the lake. When the wind stops blowing, the lake quietens down, and then it becomes like a mirror. And this has a twofold effect. First of all, it reflects more accurately what is uh, the surroundings. It's not all broken up. It's, it's now like a mirror image. It sees clearly what is on the outside. And at the same time, the mud sinks to the bottom, and the waters become very translucent. And so as we look into the lake, we can see all the way down, we can see the fish swimming, we can see the seaweed rising, we can see all the way down to the bottom. And so this is a very, very important part of the practice, to get the mind so that it can access deeper and deeper levels of our psyche. This is very important. Our minds become quiet and focused. I'm not going to go into the techniques, but I mean there are many, many techniques for quieting in the mind. So, okay, now the mind is, is quiet, it begins to see more clearly, it is focused. In these states, as the mind becomes more and more settled, then also the, the thinking going on in the background calms down. The mind can become very open, very spacious, very clear, very blissful. And the center of our normal thinking mind, which is in, in the brain and very um, dualistic, you know, I am meditating, this is the object of meditation, the two merge together and the center of consciousness goes down into the center of the, of the chest, what is considered to be the heart region, because not the actual physical organ. But it, it settles down and one goes into very deep states of um, mental absorption, like a trance almost, called dhyanas. And uh, sometimes because the mind in that state is very clear, very spacious, very blissful, like kind of cosmic consciousness, vast, open and spacious. People think they're enlightened. But uh, from a Buddhist point of view, this is not enlightenment. Um, it doesn't actually um, affect the total transformation of the being. Because if you go back to the lake, all the rubbish and all the stones and everything are still there on the bottom of the lake, right? So, therefore, we move on to the next point, which is the perfection of wisdom in Pragmata and into insight meditation. Now, in, in Buddhism, basically, wisdom is dealing with seeing things as they really are and not how it's presented to us through the senses and through our ordinary conceptual, mental um, way of thinking things. Of course, we have a professor here who would be much better at uh, explaining about wisdom than I am, but um, for, I'm not going to ask him to speak on this matter because he can just close his ears at this point as I completely placate the real meaning. Basically, it's, it's 
dealing with seeing things how they really are. Outer things, inner things. This, even just this dichotomy is false. It's part of our dualistic conceptual mind to think that something is out there and something is in here perceiving it. This is our fundamental ignorance, but I'm not going to go into that very deeply at this point. We don't have time and I'm not going to go on it. From the point of view of the Vipassana, from the point of view of meditation, what they are trying to help us to understand is that we are not who we think we are. Normally, if we say, who are you? You will give your name. You might tell your profession your nationality, your race. Sometimes people talk about their familial relationship, I'm so-and-so's sister, I'm the daughter of so-and-so, I'm the wife of such-and-such. And inwardly, when we think me, then we are identifying again with all those things, our family, our race, our nationality, often our profession, our body, our memories, our opinions, our beliefs, our judgments, our biases, likes, dislikes. This makes me. This is who I am and therefore I have to assert myself as being me. And so from um, not just a Buddhist point of view but also from a Hindu Advaita Vedantic point of view, this is our basic delusion. And when the Buddha talks about ignorance, he's not talking about not knowing the, the final points of quantum science. He's talking about not seeing things as they really are, but seeing it through a very deluded conceptual consciousness. So to put it very simply, Normally, we live within our minds. Our minds are endlessly chattering to us, talking to us continually, continually. Often, because we flow along with that, we are not even conscious of that. It's only when we start to meditate and try to keep our minds focused on one point that we realize how noisy our minds are. People are always complaining that, um, that, you know, their minds were better before they started meditating. <laughs> but of course, it's just that now we're more conscious of how absolutely out of control our minds normally are. And yet, we take our mind with us everywhere. We cannot escape. You know, we, even when we go to sleep, our minds go to sleep, but they come up again, talking to, it, talking to us in dreams. It's like having a, a television on the whole time, glaring away, you can't turn it off. So the first thing about meditation is that at least you begin to turn down the volume a bit. So that you can get a little space in there, a little silence. So our ordinary conceptual minds are what we identify with. And yet, when we begin to look at the mind, when we begin to actually step back and view the endless flow of the mind, we recognize that 
the minds, the thoughts are just like a flow. They're endlessly coming up, going, 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 going quicker than a, a flash of, of lightning. It's like, it's like, I mean, don't take analogies too strongly, but it's like if you go to a movie and you're seeing the movie on the screen and we are, because the movie is going on and we're listening to it, therefore we're completely caught up in it if it's a good movie. I mean, actually this is a good movie because we're playing the starring part. <laughs> There's a movie playing, right? And we're completely caught up with it. If it's a drama, then if it's a love story, <laughs> You know, if it's funny, then we're laughing. If it's sad, you know, everybody's got their handkerchiefs out. We believe it while it's happening. But if we look behind, what do we see? Actually, what's happening is that there is a projector with light. And in front of those... The film is running. Now the film is actually made up of little transparent frames. But it's going so fast that it looks like it's projecting out there a real form. Things are really happening out there on the screen and we get involved in it completely. Our hearts beat. And so this is somewhat like our situation. From the clear light nature of the mind, we are through all these little transparent frames of our thought moments, these little energy spurts, which go so fast, they look continual. We are projecting out our external reality. And nowadays, neuroscience is coming closer and closer to that view also. That most of what we see on the outside that we take to be so real and so solid is nothing like what our senses are presenting to us, and especially what the mind is then interpreting as our reality. In fact, I read recently a British neuroscientist was, had proved that uh, what we receive from our senses, the input from our senses, <clears throat> is only 15%. And the input from our mind processing what the material coming from our, from our senses is 85%. In fact, what we, we think seems so clear and so real is really just the brain very quickly um, putting together a picture which we can recognize. And then we respond to it. So we are living from our thoughts. Outside, inside, it's all thought. But what is a thought? We swim in an ocean of thoughts. What is a thought? Where does it come from? Where does it stay? Where does it go to? Where does it look like? What is a thought? So we look, we train ourselves to sit back on the banks and watch the river go by, the river of our thoughts, and to recognize thoughts as thoughts. And as we do that, then the thoughts become slower and slower as our awareness deepens. And then comes the question, well, 
who is watching the forts. And if we say, I am watching the forts, of course the ultimate question, who am I? And we begin to recognize that we are not who we think we are. All the things which we identify ourselves are ephemeral, moment to moment, rising and falling, not me at all. We can use them. We can use the conceptual mind, very useful. But we don't think it's me anymore. I mean, it's not that as we go deeper into recognizing the true nature of reality, we become spaced out. The Buddha, after his enlightenment, spent 45 years wandering around North India, communicating with people of all different classes and backgrounds and dialoguing with them, as well as organizing his whole um, community of monks and nuns and lay men, lay women. And uh, he was extremely active. And uh, throughout the ages, the great saints of all traditions, of all religions, have been extremely um, more capable than people living in, in just the, the realm of the ordinary conceptual thinking. In fact, the Buddha himself said that I too use conceptual language, but I'm not fooled by it. And the problem is we use conceptual language and we believe it. We are fooled by it. So to change uh, this, the analogy here, the nature of the mind, which is our primordial pure awareness beyond the duality of subject and object, beyond the duality of past and future, this ever-present pure awareness, which is our true nature, is compared in the traditional text to the sky is compared to space because space has no center and space has no um, ending. Space goes on forever. And yet space is out there, vast and all-encompassing, but it's also here. Actually, everything is space. We were watching a DVD recently on uh, space from the point of quantum physics. And, I mean, again, they just endorse that everything is space. Where is space not? If you uh, took the, the Twin Towers and reduced them to uh, a material form, they were about this big. I mean, smaller than that. And even that could probably be reduced. So all these very solid articles, which if I threw at you, would definitely have an impact. But they're space. We are space. Everything is space. Where is space now? It's everywhere. Now, the point is that from a relative point of view, our ordinary material perception, we can think this is mine. For example, uh, somebody was just saying today, uh, Barbara was saying today that she had an exercise with her group in which everybody's sitting now, she said to them, okay, everybody get up and change seats. And the, oh, the, the resistance to that, but this is my seat. You know, maybe they've only been sitting there five minutes, but it's my seat. If we all said, okay, now you have a tea break, now come back, and somebody's sitting there, excuse me, that's my seat. <laughs> How quickly? Right? So we have my body, my seat, my house, 
my garden, my land. We put fences around to keep people out. We have borders and customs. Try getting into America. <laughs> but space, air, you cannot say, sorry, don't you come near my piece of space. This is my space. We are all breathing in and out air. We're sharing the air here. I cannot say, don't breathe my air. <laughs> this is my air. I don't have your germs. Keep away. Even if we were the worst, world's worst enemies screaming at each other, nonetheless, we are intimately absorbing the same air I breathe it into my lungs, I breathe it out, they breathe it into their lungs, they breathe it out. We are very intimately connected on the level of space. And so therefore the mind is compared to space. It's compared to the nature of the mind, the true mind, our true pure awareness, which is filled with wisdom, compassion, light, clarity, this deep knowing aspect of the mind behind the coming and going of the thoughts, behind the coming and going of the thoughts, right now is this awareness, otherwise you couldn't hear me. There is this knowing aspect of the mind which is usually drowned out by all our busy thinking. But it's, it's like the foundation of everything. Just as space is the ultimate nature of everything. So therefore the mind is compared to space. But of course space is not aware. So it's not space. But it is this open, vast clarity which connects us all. Because you cannot say, it's the nature of my mind versus the nature of your mind. It's just the nature of mine. And in that level of consciousness, there's not even a sense of I and other. And when we recognize that, it's like being in, sometimes in one way, it's like an empty house, an empty room. Imagine an empty room in which all the doors and windows are open and the wind is just blowing through. And there's nothing to obstruct it because there's no furniture in there. Just wafts backwards and forwards and through. It's empty. It's empty. But empty doesn't mean non existent. Empty just means that it's not solid, it's ungraspable. And this is our true nature. It's very, very beautiful, beyond thought, literally. <coughs> but it's who we really are, all the time. If only we could recognize it. And so the point is that when we do recognize it, then immediately compassion arises because we understand our true potential. Our potential, the potential of all beings, and how, how what a low level we live at compared with who we really are. It's the traditional example is of a beggar who lives in a hovel and underneath there's this huge treasure buried. But he doesn't know. So he goes out every day and just gets a few coins and feels himself rich. But all the time he's a, a billionaire. But he doesn't know. So each one of us, inwardly, are, are so worthy beyond thought. And yet we're living like, like paupers. We're homeless. So we need to come back to our home. 
And this is what the spiritual life is about. All spiritual paths are about dropping, <laughs> transforming that small self, that little self, which gets in the way, but which we cling to and identify with, to open up to something so much vaster, which is our true nature. <coughs> and so all spiritual paths should be leading to that. It shouldn't be an enhancement of the ego. This is the big danger, is that then our sense of, of, of um, self and me just uh, appropriate these very precious spiritual teachings and just use it to inflate our sense of self-importance. But if it is used to uh, help us to let go of our grasping, clinging mind and open up to something which is so much vaster, so much more infinite, and so much more joyful, beyond thought, literally beyond thought, and yet totally aware, totally, totally clear, then we can say our life has had some meaning. So all of you, please, you are very lucky. You are very privileged. You are all highly educated. You can all think for yourself. You are living in a country which, up to now, you can believe what you want and you can... <laughs> you can practice what you want. And so, don't lose this opportunity. You know, please, I, I beg of you. Practice now in your life to, to really use whatever spiritual path talks to you. Really take it and merge it with your daily life. So that you transform your life, not only for yourself, but for others also. One good indication is if people start saying to you, you know, you're ever so much nicer now than you used to. <laughs> Especially if your family told you that. Okay? <laughs> So please don't waste this lifetime, please make something meaningful, so that when we die, and we're all going to die, we can die without regrets. Thinking, I use this life for the benefit of myself and the benefit of others. So may it do so. Thank you.